Hi everybody, I'm here with Dr. Paul Merrick, um, esteemed physician from? From the USA. You, and whereabouts in the USA? From you? Virginia. Tell me, resident of Virginia, um, why are you in Australia? Tell me about your background and you have been cited many, many times in, for your experience and knowledge and ability and you've written how many books? So I've written four books and then more recently a book on cancer, uh, you know, that was called Cancer Care. Right. Uh, use of repurposed drugs and metabolic therapy from cancer. And I have the um, honor of being one of the very few authors who was banned. My book was banned by Amazon because I was claimed to be providing misleading information. Is that like misinformation or is it disinformation? It's the same thing. <laughs> and obviously we challenged them and there was an enormous challenge because every statement in my book was cited by peer-reviewed literature. And so it, it, it was ridiculous. I mean, and I got a lifelong ban from Amazon. But there was a big outcry because obviously this was a big challenge to a big farmer. And so the book was reinstated. They unbanned me. So uh, you were unbanned. I was unbanned by Amazon. And is, how's the book selling? So the book was doing really well. So what we did, it may be unusual, is we provide the book free of care on our website, just because our goal is not to make money but to distribute the information. Because you know, there are people who have cancer all over the world. Um, not all of them ha have access to Amazon or can afford the book. So we made the book available as a PDF for free. And then for people who actually wanted a hard copy of the book or a Kindle version, they could get it at a very low cost from Amazon. Now, the Australian Medical Professionals Association have brought you out here. Um, tell me why they brought you out here. <laughs> well, they, they, you know, myself and Dr. Del Gleish, you know, they brought us both out here, really to, it was an impact to empower patients and to um, move the needle forwards. So, you know, we've spoken a lot about COVID and the COVID mischief, but also, you know, what how patients and physicians can empower themselves so there's some hope for the future. But really, it was a, a journey of telling the truth because I think a lot of what's happened in the last three years is we've been told a lot of misinformation and disinformation Although that's what I've been accused of, I mean, the converse is really the, the truth. So we're really here on a mission to, to, to speak to Australians, to try to educate them, to provide some hope and to provide some insight into the last three or four years. Dr. Paul, this may sound very strange to you, what I'm going to ask you to do now, but if you had a message for our Prime Minister and Cabinet Ministers, and they were sitting here, what would you say to them? Yeah, so the first thing I would say is the vaccines are not safe and effective and I think they cause enormous harm, they cause death and um, they need to be banned immediately. I think the use of these products is not a vaccine, it's gene therapy, it's a crime against humanity. I think to vaccinate children is goes beyond any kind of reasonable um, thing to do. Children have an exceedingly low risk of dying of COVID. The risk is less than 0 0.0003. In fact, the data shows a child is more likely to drown in a bathtub than they are to die of COVID. Healthy kids don't die of COVID. And yet they're giving them this experimental therapy. The long-term effects have not been determined. We know that it causes myocarditis in children. We know that it potentially increases the risk of cancer in children. We, know, we don't know what all the long-term consequences are. It's criminal negligence to vaccinate children and pregnant women with this untested product. Now, you, you say that it causes myocarditis in children. Just explain myocarditis to me and what are the long-term effects of myocarditis? If you can. Yes, so basically myocarditis is inflammation of the muscle of the heart. We, we, had, we, we had seen you know, isolated instances of myocarditis prior to COVID. There's a particular uh, virus called Coxsackie B that can cause a viral myocarditis in, in a child 
or in a young adult, but it's exceedingly rare. What we've seen now with the rollout of these uh, genetic therapies is a resurgence, uh, a significant resurgence of myocarditis. And um, this can't be hidden. So, in fact, they're, they're one of the best studies was done in, in Thailand. They prospectively looked at a whole bunch of, of kids because it appears to be more common in young men. So they took a bunch of school kids they followed them prospectively, and remarkably, something like 20% of them developed evidence of myocardial injury. Now, if you have a myocardial injury like that, is it, does it heal? So that's a good question, because we don't know the answer, but follow-up studies suggest that the, many of these patients may have persistent heart dysfunction. It heals by scar formation. So the likelihood that these young people, um, and we have a cardiologist nearby, the likelihood that these people will develop a normal cardiac function is, is somewhat unlikely. And the other problem is, is it may increase the risk of having an arrhythmic event or an arrhythmic death later down the line. Now let me take you back four years. I know that's hard, but let me take you back four years to where, we, where all this began. There was a, a lot of fear right across the community, all from, from, from senior uh, medical professionals all the way through the politicians, from prime ministers, from ministers, all of them were in fear and trying to say how we're going to manage this terrible disease that's coming upon us. Explain that to you. How, how, did, how, could, that, how could that have been? Because I remember hearing things that I couldn't believe what they were putting to me. Yeah, so I think the original, the idea was to generate fear. So I think this was a predetermined plan by the developers of this pandemic, is to generate fear. Because when people are scared, then they're going to be more susceptible to influence and they're going to be, they do things that they normally wouldn't do. So I think their goal was to in, instill a sense of fear. And the truth was not, you know, we were all witness to the TV reports and the media reports of all these people dying of COVID. And obviously it was ex enormously exaggerated. I think much like in, in, in Australia, in the US they developed this, they were expecting all of these people to present to hospital with respiratory failure. And so they built these hospitals. In New York there was a naval ship that was brought in that was never used. So they, I think on purpose, exaggerated the severity of the disease. They scared people. And I think that the, the purpose was to get people to be vaccinated because the vaccine was seen as the solution. So if you get the vaccine, you won't infect grandma, you won't infect your, infect your colleagues, you won't go to hospital and you won't die. And so we know all of those are complete lies because it doesn't prevent transmission, it doesn't limit hospitalization, and it doesn't limit death. And so this was a way of, I mean, it was brilliant um, marketing campaign that they embarked on. It was nothing more than a false marketing campaign trying to instill fear into people and therefore forcing them or encouraging them or twisting their arm or whatever means to get a vaccine which they didn't need. And it wasn't a vaccine? And it wasn't a vaccine. We know it's not a vaccine, it's gene therapy. So they had this gene therapy and they called it a vaccine. Was that a marketing ploy? Oh, of course. I, I think, you know, because people know what a vaccine is. And, and so, you know, having gone to medical school many years ago, most doctors believe mistakenly that the single biggest progress made in the history of medicine was the development of vaccines. It's kind of engraved in, in stone. It's not even taught in medical school because it's, it's considered so obvious that you don't even need to teach about it or discuss it. It's as obvious as the sun and the moon. And so the prevailing dogma is that vaccines were the single, common, single most important invention in medicine. 
And actually, when you look at infectious diseases, whether this be, you know, polio or measles or mumps, the risk of dying plummeted way before the introduction of vaccines. It was due to public health measures, better water, better sanitation. You know, those measures were really important in controlling these infectious diseases. Well, explain this to me. Um, when the infections are reaching their height, uh, they brought in lockdowns and uh, the infections start to drop. Can you explain that to me? So I think what happened is that there were waves of patients getting infected and then obviously there would be waves of, of serious illness and dying. And I think the lockdowns were timed on the descent of the, the deaths. So it appeared, it, it appeared that the um, lockdowns had an effect. But if we actually look about it, it, it had minimal effect. And the most important thing is just common sense would dictate that lockdowns don't work. So the way the virus spreads is by aerosol spread and not droplet. Yeah. And that's a really important concept because locking down people, isolating people, limiting contact to six feet is not going to work because the virus spreads in the air sometimes many different miles. You know, we know from SARS-1 that, it, you know, people on the ground floor transmitted the virus to people on the upper floors of apartment buildings because it was, it was traveling in the air. And so the whole idea that locking down people or putting on a mask or putting on a mask or social distancing would have any effect is an absurdity. We've never done that for any other disease. Um, there was no evidence it worked. The evidence now strongly suggests that it doesn't work. Mass may actually increase the risk of infection because you're rebreathing the air. You push the people all together. And you're pushing people together and people are, are co continuously touching their face and their eyes and their nose. So it actually may increase your risk of infection. So these so-called countermeasures were counterproductive. Mm. And it, it, anyone with any common sense should have realized this. Um, but it was part of the agenda to control human behavior. Dr. Paul Merrick, uh, you're here with Professor Angus Dalgleish on this program. There is a, um, an interview with Professor Dalgleish, which I would suggest everybody have a look at because it, it's a marvellous interview. And this interview too, please listen. These are two very eminent people, uh, doctors from around the world. And they have a message. And that message is that we got it wrong and we need to do it right. Now, I don't know what changes we can make in this country to do it right, but the first thing we can do is stop jabbing people. And to tell the truth, I think you know, what's really important is stop the censorship because science is based on people exchanging ideas. Science is never fixed. Science is never finite. And so science is always developing, growing, and it's based on exchange of information. And that way we all grow. And by censoring science, you're basically decapitating science. You're preventing true science. It you know, gives you the Fauci science, so it allows you only one side of the argument. And so it's really important we stop the censorship at all levels. We should... Well, one more thing before we go. We'll have to finish it here. Um, Around the world, people like me get told, these vaccines, they call them, save millions of lives. Millions of lives. I've never seen any evidence to prove that, that they're put into me. Yeah, so that's the, so there are two common misconceptions or two common myths that are perpetuated. The one people say, oh, I had COVID, but it would have been a lot worse if I wasn't vaccinated. That's what they keep on saying. Absolutely. And that's obviously false. And this idea that the COVID vaccine saved millions of lives, millions of lives is a lie. We know the opposite is true. The absolute opposite. The COVID vaccines have killed millions of people. The number of excess deaths in almost every Western nation, the most vaccinated countries, have the highest risk of excess mortality. 
So th there's no evidence. If there was really good evidence that the vaccine saved lives, you would have the data, I would have the data, we'd all have the data. It just doesn't exist. It's part of the propaganda and misinformation that they're perpetuating. And that's not a bad place to stop. Thank you. No, thank you.